There we go. So welcome back everybody for uh, ID24. Our next presentation is by Suzanne Clark. Suzanne is a visual designer and she's been working with Children's BBC for the last two years and she's going to tell us a bit about her experience of making accessible games at the BBC. Um, without further ado, uh, I'll pass it over to you, Suzanne. Or oh, in a quick reminder for the children at home uh, that if you've got any questions, just tweet them to the hashtag ID24. Now, over to you, Suzanne. So, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Suzanne. I'm just recently a senior user experience designer at the BBC, having started midway two years ago. Um, I started my career as a graphic designer in 2000 and worked for a mix of public and private um, companies. And um, as soon as I hit the BBC, I was just blown away by their values, the fact they want to serve everyone. Um, and actually, I can't believe that I'm presenting on such a big forum at the moment today and feel as though I'm talking out there to space, but it's an interesting experience. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is quite a personal journey through understanding accessibility. I was talking to the accessibility team at the BBC who are really well renowned for the work that they do. And I was just saying, what, what should I talk about? What would be the best? The, what would people get the best, the most information out of? Um, and it was very much just your experience. Like, what's it like as a designer to admittedly not do so much, spend so much time thinking about accessibility in the earlier parts of my career, and then how that's developed into now speaking on an expert forum and um, trying to get buy-in from everyone from all different levels. So. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to get started. So while I was asking what we should talk about, um, I, w I asked around about what it was like at the BBC before I started two years ago. What, what games were out there? What was accessibility like? What were the conversations like? And it seemed like um, it was very much a golden age of Steam. And by Steam age, I'm talking about Flash. So when Flash was in full swing, um, it just seemed like everyone knew what they were doing. It was very predictable. It was supported throughout. Um, it felt very economical to produce these fantastic games for people. Um, and it was reliable. So I thought, what a, what a wonderful time to be making games, you know. And um, it just seemed like that was a time when um, when accessibility happened, and it happened for a reason, and thought went into it, but it, was, it didn't seem to be a big um, part of the decision making. It just sort of happened, and everything was chugging along with a nice golden age of steam. Um, and in terms of customers, it was, it was accessible. Um, it was so beautifully interactive. People hadn't used the web in that way before. They were really engaged. And as developers and designers, it was really updatable. I remember using Flash and just feeling so comfortable in the environment. Um, being, yeah, just being able to make things that you knew people were um, happy and you were giving that extra value on such an amazing platform. However, stop three of the journey was all about running out of steam, sort of. There started to be a few frustrations, things started to feel the same. Um, people were moving elsewhere and looking for new technologies. So um, it felt like there were no guards, you know, there's like people. weren't quite so happy because there was new things on the horizon so things started to feel a bit heavy and then obviously flash became unsupported by um technology and everything started to feel less economical so the road became a little bit more bumpy um and then technology boost so i was talking to a colleague about this about the fact that you can trundle along and it's lovely and you feel that everyone knows what they're doing with accessibility and they're making really nice games and whatever but if a new technology comes it's like all the focus goes it's a huge boost all the focus goes to that new place um and you've got lots of excited passengers 
Um, and you got, and you still maintain the loyal ones. You know, there were really lovely games that people were still wanting to play. Um, but for just the things like um, our jigsaws, and the, we have, we've got a really nice staring out game that just literally is um, space. You press your space bar to stare out at someone else, and then you win prizes, and it's just really, really rewarding. Um, but nothing about them was configurable and, um, and as I say all, all the interest went up for the exciting new electric high-speed mobile um, platforms. So we hit a point we just sort of said stop what's going on here and um, we've got some some of the most loyal customers they've got very valid tickets they've got very valid reasons to want to use our products but they're not we're not serving them anymore. We've been, we've been too busy focusing elsewhere. So stock five was all about taking stock. It was about starting to understand the passengers that are on board our lovely steam train and the ones that had gone off to, our, to the more electric um, products as well. It was about really reimagining what we want to do and we started to look at prototyping and really understanding what technology can what this technology can do for people um it was about retraining you know if you're used to running along and doing things in a certain way then we need to retrain staff and make sure that they're on board um and there were very traditional established views so even today i still have conversations that are really established and built on a certain track that we need to take take everyone up to new ways of thinking, um, which I'll go into later. Documentation, um, it sounds dull, but actually it's the key, it's the bridge in everything that we do. We work with a lot of external clients, we work internally, and we want to be able to say, go and have a read of our documentation, this is exactly where our head's at. Come back and ask us questions. And then um, collaborating more wildly. So I mentioned that we work with a lot of third party agencies to make our games. Um, we also want to influence bigger, wider industry vision and, um, and industry conversations. And, it, you know, it's the BBC, it's, it's, it's amazing we can do that within the UK and, and, and wider. So I'll talk a bit about that. So our passengers. Um, user experience wise, we um, we have always, always talked to our customers. Like that's the main thing. You know, it's a value of the BBC. We serve everyone. Um, but it's whether we were asking the right questions and we certainly weren't asking the right passengers what they want. So we've gone through a really insightful process around what to ask and, and how to ask it. Mainly um, customer reviews of our products. So, um, quite a hard-hitting review that we got after we'd published of um, Storytime, Playtime and Go BBC apps it was very much hard-hitting but thank you for excluding us like you just you, you haven't done everything that you need to do to make these apps accessible and hearing reviews like that really you know big gulp big like look at what the department's doing and where our focus was um, and a, bit, and a huge bugbear around that was control methods. So we just hadn't entirely reviewed how people would come to the destinations and use the, um, use the products. Um, so it's embarrassing to say, but then also it's a journey, it um, fluctuates, and, um, it's, and that was absolutely our day one of saying, right, what are we doing here? We need to talk to more people. I say we in the terms of UX and design, and these reviews went out to product and editorial and everyone. So um, everyone was bought in. But when I say we, I think I'm talking about my UX and design team, really. Um, so then we went out and we interviewed. So um, it's really great. We, we get access to some lovely schools. We get access to some lovely families. You know, as soon as you say the BBC are trying to do something a bit different here, we, you know, it, it's very much an open door policy with parents who have got fantastic ideas. Um, 
And the main things that we got from kids at this at this stage was they loved coming onto our games, but they need a little bit of guided access, a little bit of help getting around. Not enough to make them feel as though they're being treated any different to anybody else, but just a little bit of um, help along the way, um, which we admit we hadn't looked into as much as we wanted to. Um, and then also age appropriate content. So, you know, we see a lot of, of, of lovely younger kids, but some of the old kids were just saying, I'm, I'm getting a bit bored now. I'm, I'm sick of seeing. We've got a character called Mr. Tumble who's a. Um, a clown and uh, very much loved up until a certain age but then if you keep feeding kids with um, accessibility particularly motor needs Mr Tumble they get a bit bored and they, they want stuff that like, is the wider BBC so um, they were the big hitters from our interviews we did a lovely diary study that was a two-week um, spread across 20 families um, who just documented everything that they do online, all the games they play, um, what's successful, what isn't. And the main hitters from there was the collaborative play, feeling like children want to feel like they can play with their siblings, play with their classmates, anything like that. They just don't feel like they, they can do that online and the BBC has potentially got a part to play in making that happen. And for parents, it was all about making our games off available offline. Um, a lot of parents used very intuitive ways to tell their kids that the uh, internet is only on from nine till six and then the internet goes off or uh, using timers on the iPad. Um, and I really very much felt like we could help with that communication, we could um, build in functions to put in timeouts or we could um, just help help more in our way and create an app that's got all these fantastic games on that it's just easier to moderate. So then we also spoke to the wider academics. Um, it is so, speaking to academics is such a rich resource. It's unbelievable. We've got people who really concentrate on things that potentially in the BBC we might take six, seven weeks to decide on a feature or whatever then they've got people who study this for three years and really pour so much effort and insight into it so using academic resources has been fantastic for us and i'll give you a, a, an example of how that's played true on a project later but the big takeaway for us was how we could start using life skills and and social school um, cues and um, emotional empathy to really really give value to this audience and really um, work with them and yeah I mean I, academics are, are my total go-to now I think we're, we're trying to work out between ourselves the, the balance between wanting to take a long time to research something and us needing an answer a lot quickly if it's in a product cycle or whatever but it's something that we're really keen to pursue um, and want, want to take further and then data. So um, it's interesting. It's quite an interesting analogy when it comes to data because we talk about it in terms of um, when you when you're up up in the air, serving the whole of the UK. Then every city pretty much looks the same. Like when you look down, every city looks the same. You take little snippets of data. That all looks the same. Like we could we could easily brush stroke and say, well, we have. 70,000 visitors to one product of which 100 people use our settings, our accessibility settings. That's, that's how that city looks, that's how that product looks. Actually, when you land in the city, it is so much more nuanced, it is so much more intriguing. And I think everyone at the BBC is bought into the fact that, that those 100 people who are using the settings or what make the city unique and they are exactly who we want to please and target. Um, so data has been really valuable um, in, in so much as it's the opposite to what you'd expect. So it's the opposite to saying we, um, right, well, it's 10% it's of our audience wants to use these features. Like that's maybe what our product would, you, would base their decisions on. Whereas we're saying, 
about less than one percent use it but that's exactly why that is exactly why it's so valuable to those people so we've really been taking a better look at our data and every game has got um, stats around what's switched on, what's switched off, um, duration of time and, and points where people leave and we can make really valid hypotheses around what we can do better in the future. So the data for us at this stage was telling us that we're not communicating right, we're not communicating what our games do, um, we're not communicating to parents, children don't know that they can go into these settings and configure however they want, so um, that was really interesting. And then data competitors wise, where are we losing people, what, what, what's everyone going to, what's the need, um, and it's all really powerful stuff to take into stakeholder meetings and things like that. So. As part of our stop five, we started to prototype. Um, it's all very well being a designer and trying to verbalize what you want, but it, you know, we, we just needed to start building and, and see it. And we needed to do it away from any product delivery streams or anything. We needed to just have time to say we are exploring these, these things, um, which I'll go into. So our main prototypes, were based around control methods. So as I said, our reviews were saying, you have not given enough consideration to my child who wants to just come onto a game and just use one button to activate it, or just wants like some really simple controls. So we built a prototype called Shouty Golf, and that is based around using one button control to um, plant your golf board, I don't know what the term is, but Play, go through through the whole um, grounds of the golf course and land your golf ball. Um, and then also using voice activation. So you can just say put, put, and it goes in. You could also just clap or anything like that. Really simple. It took three weeks to build. It's not perfect, but it was perfect for us to take out user testing. Um, then we built, a, an, or I should say that we worked with a company called Magnetic North and another one called Complete Control who were absolutely brilliant in, in helping us work out who we wanted to target and what methods we wanted to use to get the best results out of this research. So um, another one we created was Spin and that was all about giving the right visual cues and building up the experience based on your um, how able you were to complete the experience um, but also really supportive really like if you deserve uh, you can then um, be magnified onto these circles that you jump through and if you if you jump really badly then you fall to the ground and then there's a really graceful little angel that comes up and you know it's, it's a really actually quite a nice part of the experience a bit like Fossy Road where it's a bit of fun to get knocked down um, with this it was all about guided access so you can stay on and stay um, magnified to circles as you're jumping over but you're also given really really good amount of cues and instruction to help you to guide you through the um, experience um, I've got to say that one has gone down really well in our user testing um, we also built an experience called beatbox so this was all around initially making something that's age appropriate so making something that's just a little bit skewed older maybe eight to nine year olds cause and effect um, really easy just just one tap interactions to make a movement and cycle you through a journey on a game however we didn't really know what easy looked like in that scenario and what difficult looked like 
We wanted to make something that was um, had the right balance, um, adapted accordingly. Um, so we made this little fish game where you eat the fish, avoid the sharks, and it's one tap to go through different lanes. Um, and it's proved really valuable to make. Um, a big part of the insights that we were talking about was collaborative play. So we've made um, our pitch and book game, which I mentioned re um, previously, made that into um, a one player or two player experience, which is lovely to test with. And then communication. So where are we putting these settings? We know that people aren't going to, to our actual settings in a game. Certainly children, why would they ever want to go on a cog icon? So, um, so yeah, we just started to look about how we'd label an area and what would make practitioners want to um, click on it and parents more than anything. So our findings from these prototypes, when it came to control methods, um, I've put fun on this slide because particularly with Beatbox, we had a real moment where we said, okay, we've built that really nicely. When you go on the iPad, you put voiceover on, you can explore by touch, it tells you where to put your beats. But it is not fun. We just completely missed the point with it. There was nothing that really orientated someone onto the experience or whether it was just, here's beat one of eight, here's beat five of eight. And it's just really missed the point with fun. And it was so valuable to put it in front of the kids of them to go, yeah, you know. So I mean, they love the end result where they got to build a cacophony of orchestra and instrument, but they did not find it fun setting it up. So it, Lots of food for thought. Then um, it, needs, it just needs to be more instant. So I said cause and effect when it came to the um, big fish, little fish game. But that is by no stretching the imagine a cause and effect game. And we just got trapped into thinking that you've got to have a narrative and a journey and take kids along. When actually a lot of the kids that we tested with literally just wanted the tap on the screen and have an amazing reward at the end. So we're going to look into a lot more experience around that. And then with the golf game, with it being um, triggered by microphone and vocal, it was very precarious. Um, so we need to work around how we would limit the amount of time that the microphone would be switched on for to take in the input or something because we were in a busy classroom and the golf balls were going all over the place. Luckily, it was just on screen. When it came to age appropriate content, um, our our feedback was very much um, that there's some really lovely concepts out there. There's some really um, fantastic examples. Things like Blind Legend, um, Shades of Doom, um, really immersive experiences, but not, not for a younger audience. So we've walked away just going, right, what can we do in this space to be really creative? Um, but skew towards a younger audience. We also had lots of conversations around, you know, which characters do you like? Who, who, who would you want to play games with? How can we use these games to make you learn or whatever? And a lot of the feedback was that CBBC and CBBS have got some fantastic characters, but the wider BBC has got some fantastic resources and fantastic content and really good hooks to get kids in that we're not using. So it's really made us think about our wider portfolio and what we can be doing in the accessibility space with these fantastic brands. And then wider learning in terms of, um, as I said, if, if someone's a screen reader user and they're going out to work, then maybe we, sh we could be looking at how we can make gamify um, learning jobs, learning um, different screen readers and learning how to use voiceover. Um, and equally, how we can gamify using switch device, or given that, like helping people with their most fine motor skills through games. When it came to difficulty, um, we realised that pace just has to be configurable. That it sounds obvious, but um, I think that we could decide in a room what to do with a game, but. It's, it's never going to be perfect for everyone and if we need to put in settings that um, you can you can decide how quickly you want auto scan to work, you can decide how quickly you want the fishes to come on screen and how quickly you want to move between lanes. Um, 
it just has to be configurable, but that goes hand in hand with our communication of where the, what happens within settings. Um, and then balancing pace with adaptive difficulty. So um, a lot of parents just said, we don't go into settings and our, our kids don't know how to. I'd love it to adapt on the move if they're doing really well, ramp up, back and down, but still being able to override that, which I think is really important. Um, the no fail mode, we had some lovely quotes from kids um, just saying, yeah, they're, you know, they're happy to be guided through things, but they definitely don't want to feel like they're coming onto experience and they're giving a bit of a, a helping hand too much. Like they don't want to feel like they're cheating, um, which I thought was so valuable because, you know, we could, we could just say like, skip ahead, you've done really well, skip ahead. But actually, they want to still feel like there's a challenge or something achievable. Um, without feeling like they're cheating, which I thought was really good. And then um, definitely starting to take more review where we make our games around complexity disclosure and how we orientate the children onto our experiences. Um, by complexity disclosure, I'd say that Beatbox, we've got some really good advice from Jamie Knight, who's um, a developer at the BBC who just said the initial experience is just too clunky, but if you really disclosed each instrument at a time and the reason for doing everything at certain times, then um, that would make for such a better experience. And it's, it's true, it would. Um, so we looked around collaborative play, as I said, um, we had a multiplayer experience. How we'd set it up was that you need two separate devices over a Wi-Fi. You need to enter, the, enter a code so someone's a host and then someone joins into the game and then they can play the golf experience together. Um, that was too complex. We've got lots of video footage around kids just going, what's happening here and needing help. So we definitely want to explore multiplayer. Um, it levels the playing field. It makes like the sibling relationships lovely to to witness that they're playing together, but we really need to simplify that. So that's something we're looking into. And then um, looking at collaborative play as part of our user suitability testing of our products. So um, I'll talk about it in a bit more depth, but we really just are meeting these fantastic kids and we just want them to be a part of, of what we make. And if we can set that up as a collaborative play rather than say, we're designing the game, what, you, what you're thinking, you know, hand them over sort of thing. If we can um, make experiences where they can get, really get involved and talk to us and break down any barriers between communication between adult and child, then that would be, that's, that's our perfect dream. And then communication is twofold in terms of um, within our games, we want to um, offer more audio rewards it's, you know, we shamefully leave audio till the end and we shouldn't. And then also communicating externally about what we're doing and very much not saying these games are special for you. It's very much about making our mainstream games just happen to be things, making our games really truly accessible that mainstream kids would just happen to love as well. Without sort of saying these are special for you. So that's a, that's a challenge for us. So, stop five. Training internally. So all these fantastic insights are brilliant. Um, and we use them to, re to inform our requirements for future games. Um, but before we do that, we're not going to just hand over a list of requirements. We really need to make sure that all, um, all our staff are on board and understand why we're doing it. So we've gone through a period of training with everyone. Um, we tweak this training. so. When it comes to stakeholders, it's very much about being in the meetings there in very busy people. I'm, I don't want to speak for them, but I imagine if we say there's a two day training course on accessibility, they might not be able to find the time to do that. So we're very much going into meetings and um, videoing a lot of case studies. So it brings a lot of the challenges that we're facing alive. Um, and talking about what happens if we don't do anything. What happens if our competitors do do things and we don't do anything? Where does, what does, what's that make the BBC look like? Luckily, I'm not in a commercial environment, so I don't really have to, to like, 
bring up numbers and budgets and finance and stuff, it's enough to say we're not serving this section of our audience, which is fantastic. But I think in other places to work, um, things like bringing, like bringing case studies into meetings and having a representative at all stakeholder meetings is essential. When it comes to product management training, it's all about um, sharing a, vo a vocabulary, so getting everyone on an equal footing around what we're talking about. Um, I've only been doing this for two years and I already slip into technical speak. Um, so it's about bringing everyone up to speed or adapting how I, how I talk about things so I can easily comfortably talk about adaptive experiences and orientation when you come onto a product. A product manager might just have completely different ideas about what I'm talking about. So we do a lot of training around that shared vocabulary. Um, and also decisions about who this is accessible for, who we're making this accessible for, what's the critical user journey, um, what are the five things that your product um, is expecting a user to be able to do, and are we serving um, our, our um, audience with different needs? on the same level as everyone else. Um, and then very much getting the product manager to work with us to make a checklist so then we can take that forward to the rest of the team. Um, so on this example I've gone with welders, but what I mean is the tech, techie guys, the people who forge everything together, the people who make things, all the magic happens, that I don't have a clue how they do it. Um, with the techie guys, it's very much training on the job. So they're really keen to have speed runs and simulation tasks based on products that they're making. Um, we started to do health checks as part of their um, sprint planning, so we just do a health check on their um, objectives and key deliverables and then weaving accessibility into that. Um, Technology-wise, it's really good with the, with the welders, with the techie guys to get the technology in, so they're really future thinking they love how like working out the nuances of how screen readers work how things would work with switch eye gaze seems to blow everyone away uh, we worked recently with a um a charity called special effect who are awesome and um they they have a racing game where you can just use your eyes to race through that goes down the treat we have once um and then Celebrating the beauty of code, and I've got to admit that I've, that I've stolen that line from a, a, a talk that I went to at CSUN this year, but there was a talk from IBM about how to get people on board, and it's so true about that whole, like we can, as designers, we look at everything visual and say, wow, how amazing, but we don't actually celebrate the code that's behind the stuff we make, so I've really like come back to the BBC and brought that in, and it, you know, it feels very natural and lovely to do. Um, then the decorators in the team, training for the decorators. We tend to, by decorators I mean design and in, in editorial staff. People who are making those lovely creative decisions about what our products are going to do and look like. Um, they, training for them, it's all about cracking real problems. Um, it's all about um, bringing them into our user testing, observing real real problems and designing for extremes. Um, so we do a lot of work around what could things look like in extreme situations and then um, the mid, then form them into the middle ground, which is, seems fantastic to do. And then really getting under the skin of our competitors, understanding what makes fantastic apps as good as they are. And then Sparkies are the ones that um, in the UK is all around the um, electrics and making things sparky. which are the effort would be used and we 
respond with a lot of empathy, a lot of stories about how by making something accessible for one person, it could, the value of that accessibility and the contribution we're giving and the um, the feedback we get from that is, is through the roof. So as I said at the BBC, we don't really have to have those many conversations, which is fantastic. From a um, product manager point of view, it's like, will this affect the time? Are we going to have to put more budget into everything? So we're starting to to have a shared understanding about the fact that if we get accessibility built in from the start, then it really doesn't add that much time and it doesn't add that much budget, unless we're really looking at very specific, innovative ways of working, in which case we establish that at the start of the project. Um, from a welder's point of view, it's like, is this going to start being a bit too complex? So we add in complexity that doesn't need to be there. How can we simplify the code? So it's just about listening to those and responding and, and just sort of building trust that every decision that we're making is based on real solid user needs and user stories. From a design point of view, maybe the, the, the main questions are, do, do we have to dumb everything down? Does everything have to be babyish? But I think I've answered that on previous slides that we're looking at the wider BBC and the fact that very simple interactions can have a more adult Based in a more age specific approach. And then from the Sparkies are maybe looking to find out like where are these audiences? They're not discovering us at the moment. So where are they? So we do our best to try and talk to the audience and find out where they're based and what we can do for, do for them and be where they are, like base our products where they are. Um, so that, you know, that includes the app store, of course, but it's also looking online and, and see what we can do there. So documentation sounds very, very dull, um, but it's something that we put a lot of time into. As I've mentioned, we work with a lot of third parties and internal um, dev teams. So the first port of call is our conversation first and then documentation, what we're doing. So this is very much how it works on a day-to-day -day basis at the BBC. This is a user experience designer's job. So sorry if it gets a bit dull, but this is how we work. So this is the, these are our core values when it comes to accessibility. Um, we have our accessibility support document, and these are our core values. So as a UX designer, I'm working with our QA teams. We make sure that these are checklisted off. Um, so audio and visual effect controls. Um, that, that's just all around the fact that, you, that we want to be able to switch off. We don't want anything to autoplay. We want to be able, the user to be able to switch off. So we need to make sure that we've got the UI in place to make that happen. Um, color contrast. We make sure everything goes through the right tools. Um, only yesterday, you know, I feel like I'm an experienced designer, but only yesterday I was looking at a brand that I thought was totally fine for color contrast, and another designer questioned it. And it just made, made us both realize that everything needs to be tested, nothing can be taken for granted. Um, we're looking very much at our tutorials and how we're onboarding, and that's for us to um, make sure that we're asking the right questions, not putting too much information or barriers in the way. Um, making tutorials feel like they're a fun part of a game. Um, making sure that every single item on the screen that has a visual representation as also has an audio equivalent. Um, really big key one, but following the BBC mobile guidelines, it's a wealth of information. Um, we very much worked with the guidelines and plucked out what we needed for our games, but then when complex um, patterns come into play, like keyboard trapping or whatever, we very much dig back down and make sure that we understand where to find things in the guidelines. Um, structure and focus, it's up to us to make sure, in the same way as visual, we make sure that as, as someone's tabbing around the screen, they can um, find things in a logical order. And quite often, we'll put together additional documentation with numbers saying this is how we want things to work. And um, we make sure that everything works on multiple inputs, keyboard, touch, and mouse. Um, and equivalent to the audio, we um, make sure that everything that is visual has an audio equivalent as well. Um, it's quite obvious when games come in and the hit areas aren't well thought through or whatever, 
but since working more with eye gaze software it's really made me realize how much we need to even give more space around hit areas so that goes into our um, main document on that and then a hard one to police I don't like that word but a hard one to keep on top of is the native design features but every design we implement needs to work with the native design features of um, of every device um, so as I say it's, it's a hard one to um, police but equally val valuable and potentially something that that all of our teams should be doing a bit more of, if I'm honest. Okay, so I've just noticed I've got about 10 minutes, so I'll um, crack on unless I'm told to stop, stop talking. Um, our support documentation, so that's our, they're our core values, what I showed you before. This support documentation is our pillars. These, this is where we say, say a game comes in and it's, Danger Mouse is a Danger Mouse game. Um, we want to have Danger Mouse, if you don't know the character because it's very UK, but it's a cheeky mouse who goes around um, with his sidekick and solves crimes in a very haphazard way. So we want to represent that online. And um, So say a Danger Mouse came, game comes in and, and we've already said it'd be really great if he's in his car and he's going through a street in London. Um, how are we going to make that as accessible as possible? So in that, in that example, we said, well, we could really make that accessible for people with partial or total sight loss because um, when you change lanes, say there's four lanes, we'll change the audio to tell you which lane you're in. When you're coming up to an obstacle, we're going to give you a little bit of warning that the obstacle's in your lane and then you can shift accordingly. Um, these sorts of conversations have become really, really creative and fantastic. Previously, they were a bit sort of, um, I don't know what diplomatic word to say, but just a bit tough going. We really had to get people on board. But given that we've got this documentation and we're being very clear about who we're making things for, we want our games to be fully audio described. How does that happen? We talk about it and we come up with some fantastic solutions. So. Um, so back to the danger mouse analogy, visual we feel as though we could really make, make that game visual. Motor wise, well we're saying that we want um, our danger mouse car to auto, auto scan, auto move around and then you can decide how you play that game. Um, so our ambition is to do that but then also consider how we can adapt the game so that it's fully accessible with these features so that means Configurable, making things configurable again. So the speed of the car can slow down or the amount of obstacles that are in Danger Mouse's way, we could reduce them. Um, that's what we're going to do. And then um, from a cognitive level, we're saying, let's um, change the difficulty. So um, let's have a no fail mode, which was a really, really big thing. So at least for the, um, the first time you come on, let's, um, have it so that when you hit an obstacle, you don't die, you don't go back to the beginning, there's no trauma. It's just hit an obstacle, bounce back a bit, and then carry on with your journey. Um, it's so valuable to build in and something that's just overlooked before we've had these documentations and conversations in place. And then for hearing impaired, we want to build in some, and we're actually, I think we're quite good with, um, Catering for kids with hearing impairments, we do um, build in our subtitles. However, we went to a school recently and, and the feedback was, why would I want subtitles with black bars and text at the bottom of my game? I just want to play my game, right? So um, it's all about building supportive text in, so you can give prompts about left or right or whatever, but do that as if it's on um, Danger Mouse's dashboard or it's done in a really creative way. And then more haptic feedback, we're really looking into how we can make something feel just that a bit more exciting through haptic feedback. So industry collaboration is um, huge for us, it's huge. Um, I was only recently talking to my line manager about all this work and the fact that I was coming to speak on this forum and she was just like, well, you know, if the BBC aren't doing it, who are? Like, we need to really really push out what we're doing, really shout about it, share 
our views, hear reviews back, tell us where we're going wrong. Um, so we do that well with the um, online game industry and the people that we work with. Um, but potentially we want to do that even, wi even wider. Um, so that's a forum if anyone wants to get in touch. We talk to talk about the, the games that are happening internationally and how our findings can, can work. But these are just examples of how working with agencies in the UK has helped us to improve our games. So from a hearing perspective, we made Danger Mouse an underground game. And every step of the way, you're given uh, this visual feedback that's branded and feels very much part of the game. Um, we made a game called Something Special that is um, Mr. Tumble, who I mentioned before, who's this clown character. He's a big star in the UK. He's on every TV program um, in different guises. But essentially, this Something Special game is really inclusive. It's about him going out and talking to kids um, all over the UK with all different needs. There was no way that we could make an online game that wasn't the most accessible. Um, so previous games were something special, absolutely nailed it, they did so well. Um, it, there was one called Out and About that Ian Hamilton was the, the, the thinking behind and that was totally configurable. It was, it was totally how many, how many bubbles can you pop, how many do you want to pop, at what speed. Um, I think it even went so far as which characters don't you want to see on the screen. Sorry if that's false information, but the, the amount of detail and configuration that went into that game is just held true and, and parents and children still talk about it now. So it was quite a, quite a big shoes to fill to make another HTML5 game that was around this character. Um, but what we did was we, um, we, did, we adapted difficulty. So the, the premise of the game is that you pick an item very much like uncovering a cup, which item is in, in between the cup, you know, three cups type scenario. And um, so we made that adapt um, difficulty. We also put that in full color blind mode. We had an auto scan so that it um, works for people using Switch. Um, and you know, I think, I think we did okay, but we've got another one coming. So I think we'll be looking for, for the successes and failures in that game and, and trying to make it better. Um, the bottom left is a game called Operation Ouch, which was a pre-existing game that wasn't accessible. And even though we try our best not to retrofit any, anything, in this circumstance, we just said we, we want to. You know, it's a really popular game. There's no reason why we couldn't retrofit and have a one-button mode. So we talked to um, experts, particularly Barry Ellis, who gave us advice on how Switch, how switch could move between lanes um, and again pace and difficulty um, and that's going live this month so please have a look that was operation ouch and then finally um we worked on a game called um spot Pots. and that was a company called um good boy who write pixie.js the code you're gonna have to um forgive me for not being very technical when i talk about this but essentially now that our, all of our advice for uh, switch accessibility has gone into that game, it means that other people can take Pixie.js and make their games more accessible, which is a huge high five and something we want to be doing more of. Um, and then I think this is my last, yeah, pretty much my last slide. So um, this is our character Pablo. So th this, this little fellow is five and a half. He's autistic. He um, it's very much about um, the whole program has been um, commissioned about just teaching mainstream kids how people think differently. It's not it, not everyone's the same. broadcast in October. So we obviously wanted to make the best game that, that encompasses all the values of this brand. So um, 
what we initially what we did was because the broadcast had, had um, worked with co-creating with kids um, to make so everyone that's on the show, everyone who's done the illustration, everyone who's done the voiceover, they're all autistic. So it's um, we wanted to take those values forward in the game. So we worked with academics, we worked with school and particularly kids, most importantly, about what they would want mainstream kids to know about, or typically developing kids to know about how they live their life, what challenges, what they like to do, what challenges they face daily. So it was things like social situations um, and body awareness. So um, I think brushing, uh, this example is showing brushing your teeth, which probably isn't the strongest one because um, it was more about like visiting the hairdressers, going to supermarkets, like busy environments. They were the examples that the kids gave that they would like other, other kids to understand that to find them a challenge. Um, on to, and, and emotional empathy. So we've got um, a, a, a mini game that's all around, you know, Pablo's. This has happened to Pablo. How do you think he might be feeling? And um, how would you feel in this situation? Right, I'm sorry, Suzanne. Um, I have to okay. jump in and give you a time check. We're, we're yeah, on, no, that's fine. I've right, only got so. like, yeah, no, so, that's good. So, just having a look over the Twitters, I don't think there were any questions, just lots of comments, mainly from myself about Mr. Tumble. Uh, <laughs> so, I will take the opportunity to say uh, thank you very much for taking part in ID24. I mean, presentations like yours are what make ID24 what it is. Uh, for anybody who's got any more questions following from this presentation, uh, just go on Twitter. Uh, either on our hashtag or Suzanne, I'm sure we will be happy to, to answer. And we're just going to have a short uh, switch over and we're going to be back with uh, Molly Ford Williams on the hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>